Good morning. If you have your Bible, open to Isaiah chapter 40. Our text this morning is Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 5. Take every chance you can to get into the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. Chapter 40, verse 1 begins, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Think for a moment, what kind of people need to be comforted? What kind of people need comfort? In the context of our text this morning, it's those who know the accumulated record of their own crimes, and not only their crimes, but also know something of the towering holiness and moral perfection of the God that they've offended. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Again, people who know something of the crimes that they've committed against that God and who at the same time acknowledge the towering moral perfection of that God. Reminds me of Isaiah chapter 6, that picture of Isaiah who enters into the, the Holy of Holies and he cries out, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So in our text this morning, Isaiah chapter 40, neither to the self-righteous nor to the self-sufficient, but to those who are weary and broken, God extends words, tender words of kindness and grace. God says, comfort comfort. In the very, 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 very first paragraph of The Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan writes, as I walked through the valley or the wilderness of this world, I came to a certain place where there was a den, and I lay down in that den to sleep. And as I slept, Bunyan writes, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, I saw a man clothed with rags standing in a certain place, heading away from his own house, with a book in his hand and a great burden upon his back. Again, this is the vision that he sees in his dream. Bunyan continues, I looked and I saw him open the book and begin to read. And as he read the book, he wept and he trembled. And not being able to contain his remorse any longer, the man gave a lamentable cry saying, what shall I do? To those broken on the rack of their own sin, to those who are burdened by the heaviness of living within a world enshrouded in darkness, to those who are poignantly aware of both their own moral deficiency as well as the failure all around them. God could have said, be done, go away, get away, not good enough, I'm finished. Isn't that how we oftentimes respond to each other? But God doesn't do that. What he does instead is to provide words of comfort, words of reassurance. It's his impulse to comfort and to reassure. And so God says to those broken in sin, he says, I see you in all of your brokenness, and my word to you is one of hope, one of comfort. Verse 2 of our text, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sin. Three tender declarations summarize the message of comfort extended to these people who are beat, beaten down and battered in Jerusalem. Three tender declarations. Your war is ended. Your sin is forgiven. Your punishment is over. Your war is ended. Your sin is forgiven. Your punishment is over. For the 6th century Jews before Christ living in exile in Babylon, this message of forgiveness was one of reprieve. 70 years of exile in Babylon would finally be ended. Cyrus, that king of Persia, would release them from captivity. The exile would be over. They would go home. Yet the trouble we make with our sin is nothing compared to the trouble we are in because of our sin. 
the historical deliverance of the Jews from Babylonian exile was only a foreshadowing of a more profound deliverance from a more dire exile, an exile in which we all find ourselves outside of Christ. You see, the Jews' problem was never simply Assyria. The Jews' problem was never simply Babylon. The Jews' problem was that they were guilty of sin before God. It's so easy for us as well, so easy for us to see the problems in our lives, broken relationships, addictions, hatred, fear, whatever the problems might be, it's easy for us to see those problems just like it was easy for the Jews to open their eyes and see that they were living in exile. Yet our problems are never just circumstantial. Our problems are never simply the things that we can see. And so our need is not just for fixing those circumstances. In our text, God is not promising to repay them for an exile that they didn't deserve. God is forgiving them. Forgiveness is something they do not deserve. Forgiveness is something we do not deserve. Forgiveness is an act of grace. Grace is the love of God flowing forth to people who do not deserve it, who did not seek it, and could not have earned it. Forgiveness is an act of grace. And grace, again, is the love of God flowing forth to people who did not deserve it, who did not seek it, and who could not have earned it. At first, Sarah Cook thought the letter that she had received in the mail was some some kind of a scam, some kind of cruel joke. The letter that she received read this, We are pleased to inform you that you no longer owe the balance of the debt referenced above. Our forgiveness of the amount you owe is a no-strings-attached gift. Eight back surgeries and more than two dozen hospital visits in the span of three years had saddled this 43-year-old with stacks of medical bills that she struggled to pay each month. She had been working as a nurse when she first sought treatment for a herniated disc, but that was before the infection had turned into meningitis and left her with unpredictable seizures, unable to drive, unable to walk without a cane. Effectively homeless, she had been relying upon the grace of family friends who let her stay with them for free. And now a nonprofit was writing to tell her that the $5,000 bill from one of her stays had been forgiven. It sounded too good to be true, but it wasn't. The New York City-based group buys up medical debt from collection agencies uh, and hospitals for pennies on the dollar, identifying accounts that belong to cash-strapped patients all over the country, and absolves their debts. She had never asked for help paying for her medical bills. Perhaps she never thought that could be possible. But that summer, a nonprofit organization partnered with a Western Michigan church that raised $15,000, and together they wiped out more than $1.8 million in unpaid bills for people in the area. You see, the grace of God is kind of like that. The grace of God is the love of God flowing forth to people who do not deserve it, who did not seek it, and could not have earned it. So think for a minute, what in the world causes God to be like that? What causes God to be full of grace and forgiving? What causes God to be like that? Because oftentimes, quite often, the altruism of people is motivated by some kind of a deficiency in themselves. Altruism within our communities and societies is oftentimes motivated by the the need to be needed or the need to be recognized, some kind of incentive like a tax breaker, maybe a free tote bag if you give a certain amount of money, like I want that free gift, so I'm going to give a certain amount of money. It's always, oftentimes it's motivated by some kind of a deficiency in ourselves. But why does God act this way? Why is God full of grace? Why does God forgive? Why does God extend comfort, comfort to people who are, who are living on the rack of their own sin? Why does he forgive people who have dug themselves into the pit? It's not even that they've been tossed there, but they've dug themselves into the pit of their own sin. Why does he forgive pe- people who blatantly disregard him and walk in the other direction? Why does he do it? 
It's because it's in his character. That is who he is. So how does he do it? How does God extend that kind of grace and that kind of forgiveness? Does he simply declare they've suffered enough? Their payment is proportionate to their debts. Let's just forget about it. Or does he say, I'm just going to close this case, drop it in a filing cabinet, and forget that it ever existed? Does he put it out of sight and out of mind? Or have they done something on their own to absolve themselves of their debt? None of those things. In fact, in the very next verse, God himself declares how he's going to do it. He declares how he, how he deals with their guilt, how he deals with their sin, and how he shows his grace and forgiveness. In the very next verse, God declares that he himself is going to show up. That he himself, God himself, is going to enter into the human sphere, human existence, that God himself will become, will, will come, that God himself will be seen with our eyes, that God will bring that comfort, that he himself will bring that comfort. That comfort will come from the visible revelation of God within the world. Verse 3, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. God himself will come. Verse 4, every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain will be made low. Uneven ground will become level. In the rough places, a plain. Though they don't see him, and in 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 this is six centuries before, before Christ is born, though they don't see him, they are to prepare for him. They are to believe that he will come. They, will, they, were, they are to believe that he will come to deliver them, not just from physical exile in Babylon, but even more significantly from spiritual exile and sin. Because it is God they have offended, and it is God who will come to deliver them. Isn't that amazing? It is God they have offended, and yet it is God who shows up to deliver them, to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. And like a triumphant king returning from battle, he's going to come to his people. No obstacle can stand in his way. No incident will cause him to delay. He will come to his people. His love is more enduring than the mountains. His zeal for his people is, is hotter than molten steel. He's going to come for his people, come to his people. We have this habit, I think, within human nature to create gods in our own image or create gods for our own liking or gods that look a lot like us. And this kind of a God that we find in our text this morning in Isaiah chapter 40 is nothing like us. This is not the kind of God in whom we are conditioned to believe. You see, gods made in our image, gods like us, would need us to appease them or impress them in order to save us. God's made in our image would need us to appease them or impress them to incentivize, in some way, salvation. But friends, God loves you with a love that's more enduring than the mountains themselves. And God's zeal for you is hotter than molten steel. That's the nature of this God, and he loves you even when you are dead in your trespasses and sins. That's the kind of God that shows up. And I truly do believe that it is a step of faith to move out of faith in those self-made gods to believe in this kind of God, the God of the Scripture, the God who is not like us, the God who doesn't run from your sin, but the God who runs to you in your sin. The God who has within his nature the character, the grace, the forgiveness to love you right where you are. Verse 5, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Viewing the future from the perspective of six centuries before the birth of Christ, viewing the future from the perspective of a Jew living in exile in Babylon, when Yahweh would come to resolve the problem of sin, when Yahweh would show up, again, in the future from the perspective of the text that we're, we're standing in this morning, 
when Yahweh would show up, it is in that moment that people would see Yahweh as he truly is. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. God is most clearly seen, most clearly understood when he steps into our history, when he clothes himself in our mortality. This is the glory of the Lord, who God really is. The glory of Yahweh, the truth of his character. When God condescends, to enter into our world, when God condescends to, to climb into the pit of our human condition, when God condescends to live among sinners, that's not an exception to his character. That is who he is. That is the truest display of what it means for God to be God. That is God. And in his coming, in his coming, he shows us who he truly is. We're in the season of Advent. Advent, the word Advent, I'm, I'm not a Latin person. Somebody could probably correct my pronunciation, but the word Advent comes from the Latin advenire. Ad is a preposition attached to an infinitive verb. Ad meaning to, near, or at. Uh, attached again to this infinitive verb, venire, to come. And so during the season of Advent, we remember the sacred side of Christmas that behind all the secular uh, veneer of trees and toys is the sublime explosion of hope and the promise of God to come to us, the promise of God to come. Isaiah 40, that God promises to come, that God promised to come, and indeed he has come. He's entered in, irreversibly entered our human condition to resolve the problem of sin. And in his coming, friends, in his coming, he has shown us who he truly is. So, again, we're in this season of Advent, and over these next uh, few weeks, as we celebrate Advent together as a church, our Sunday services are going to be loosely connected to four significant Christmas hymns, four significant Christmas songs, Christmas carols. I love Christmas songs. I don't know when it's legal for you to start listening to Christmas music in your house. Uh, we started listening on Friday, though a few snuck in a little bit early this year. Uh, but uh, Christmas songs are some of the, the, there's all those crazy ones that are, you know, about Santa and, you know, grandma getting run over by a reindeer. Uh, but there are those sacred traditions that are beautiful expressions of the reality that God has stepped into our world in a way that's unprecedented in the incarnation. And I love the fact that this year we're focusing on songs. In many ways, our, our theme is sing. And in, in throughout these weeks, you're going to hear music and celebration of music in the fact that, uh, again, we're able to express these, these things in such beautiful language and rhythm and verse. Again, this, this, the, each week we're going to pick a different, a different hymn, and we'll... we'll we're not going to preach on a hymn, but we're trying to loosely connect those hymns to the sacred text in as much as they have become sort of the soundtrack for the season. It seems appropriate to contemplate the lyrics of those sacred hymns as well. God has irreversibly stepped into our world in the incarnation. That's what we celebrate during this Advent season. So come, let us adore him. Come, let us adore him. Oh, come all ye faithful. Four stanzas in this well-known Christmas carol, four stanzas invite us to approach the season of Advent with curiosity to see who it is that has come. Who is it that has entered in? Who is it that has come? What's all this fuss about Christmas? And if you're here this morning and, 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 and perhaps you're nominal in your Christian faith, let me invite you this Christmas season to take a deeper look at what the fuss is all about. What's behind the veneer? You know, someday the veneer is gone, the tree gets old, you got to throw it away. What's behind the veneer? What is enduring behind the traditions? What's all the fuss about? O come, all ye faithful, joyful, and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. It's recorded on, in Luke chapter 2 that a child was born in Bethlehem. Angels appeared to shepherds, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Angels appeared to shepherds. But who was the child born in Bethlehem? Verse 2. I love verse 2. It's the one that you don't hear on the radio. God from true God and light from light eternal. 
Born of a virgin to earth he comes. Only begotten Son of God the Father. It's the Nicene Creed wrapped up in a few words. Mary had been told in Luke chapter 1 that she would conceive and give birth to a son. Mary responds to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her saying, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be called Holy, the Son of God. You know, every mother thinks that her child is exceptional. Mothers, you know it's true. Every child thinks that their child, every mother thinks their child is exceptional, but only one child has been born that is truly exceptional. This one is the child of God, the second person of the Trinity, the eternally pre existent Son of God has been born, has clothed himself in human flesh. Third verse of that song, sing choirs of angels, sing in exultation, sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. All glory in the highest. The birth of this child is the fullness of time, the climax of the ages, the fulfillment of the promise. In Luke chapter 2, the angel declares to the shepherds, and this will be a sign. This will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude, a multitude, a single angel. Suddenly appears there a whole multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. The angels see what the whole world must know. This child is the gift of God's grace. This child is the expression of God's love, that the love of God has flowed forth towards people who do not deserve it, who did not seek it, and who could not have earned it. So again, who is this child? Who is this child? Who is the coming of God that was prophesied 600 years before the birth? Yea, Lord, we greet thee. Verse 4, yea, Lord, we greet thee. Born this happy morning, Jesus, to thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. God has entered the pit of our human condition. God has come because he loves you. God has come because he loves you with love more enduring than the mountains, God has sought you out because his zeal for you is hotter than molten steel. God has come to forgive sinners. And in his coming, he has shown us who he truly is. So come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have at Advent to celebrate the coming of that was promised, your coming, that was promised. Thank you for, even in the season of Advent, showing us something about yourself, something that we could not have made up because it's so different than us. That it's in your character to be inclined towards us, to come after us, to love us, to love us even when we are the most unlovable. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning in, this, in, the, in the sound of my voice, I pray, Lord, that you'd be moving, your spirit be moving in their hearts to take another step in the direction of seeking to more fully understand the significance of your great love and zeal for them in Christ. Thank you, Father, for drawing us unconditionally towards yourself. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.